I'm Lise Volden. The Future Now show is brought to you by the Club of Amsterdam, an international think tank that provides a platform to discuss preferred futures. Three D printing technologies reshaping medicine. Global communities where supporting people of every demographic and belief, and a world where marketing has value to people other than advertisers. I'm Lise Volden. These are the playgrounds that we explore in this month's The Future Now show. Our first topic is presented by Patrick Crayon. He's speaking about 3D printing and medicine remade. Thanks, Lisa. You know, 3D printing, it's been around for a while, and uh, more recently it's created a lot of excitement. Uh, very often it's associated with what we call the maker movement. But there is one area of 3D printing which uh, is really going to change the world we live in, and it's in applications to medicine and medical science. Uh, in this case, the ink that's used in 3D printing, also known as bioprinting, is made up of cells in a solution. And the printer deposits cells in such a way that you can build up uh, organs. It's possible to buy one kilogram of human skin that has been created by 3D, 3D printing for $30. And people are working on hearts, livers, kidneys. Some think that these will be ready within a year. For the moment, they're pretty small, but it looks as though they will be applied not only in surgery as re replacement organs, but also in clinical trials, revolutionizing the way drugs are developed and medicines are produced and uh, healthcare uh, processes all over the world. My, my question is, what do you see as the primary ethical issue to address with use of 3D printed organs or th synthetic genes as well? And what do you see as the most viable solution to that ethical issue? To me, that's the number one hurdle to address. Yeah. Well, there are several ethical issues. In fact, some of them are quite positive in the sense that if we can use artificial organs to test new drugs, it means we don't have to use animals. So there, there are some very positive things. But on the other side, there's this whole area called synthetic biology, where we can design DNA and design new cells that actually don't exist in real life or in the natural world. So we can, in principle, print organs that have no, uh, no uh, counterpart in nature using cells that have no counterpart in nature. So this is an area that's um, at once very, very exciting, but on the other hand, it's clearly going to raise ethical issues. And it's worth uh, having a debate about that now. I would say there's big ethical issues. If we look at analogous technology that we've had recently, we had xenotransplants, we've had nanotechnology, and we have genetically modified organisms. And this seems very similar when you talk about creating cells that didn't exist before to the same dilemmas that have faced those uh, technologies and in introduction into society. So some countries have wholeheartedly grasped the nettle and are quite happy. So the United States, for example, has brought in a lot of GM technology when it comes to food, whereas the European Union has taken a whole different approach and there's been a much more guarded uh, viewpoint. So initially there was some utopia towards gene technology and cloning. I remember Dolly the sheep when, when it was unveiled and how we would, we were all talking about, could we clone ourselves? Could we have mini-me's? And I quite like the idea of having little me. I didn't have to have a girlfriend. I could just create me and I could grow me. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. And the technology proved not to be um, fulfilling the desires and the wishes that people actually wanted. And now people are much more guarded. And I think that those ethical issues will be raised, not just religious ethical issues, which might be raised about post-natural history, and that's what we're entering as a post-natural history where we can create organisms that serve our uses. But I do think that, like all technology, we'll, we'll accommodate and we'll cope with it and we will introduce it. I think the medical applications you've mentioned there, Patrick, are really exciting. Not killing animals and just creating slimes that we can test. It's got to be ideal. You could have a much quicker turnaround time if you wanted to try a, th a treatment or a therapy on somebody. So I think that that's the direction that will happen. Whether it happens in more ethical, conscious Mark? countries or not, I don't know. Thank you, Mark. One thing I, I have been giving consideration to, and what you both said speaks to this, is we've been abysmal at developing technologies and integrating it to our biosphere in general. And when you're talking 
about GMO foods, for example, I think of an example with Mexico, where you have a population of people that whose primary staple to their diet uh, is corn, when and that was their primary export, so a, a primary way of, of taking care of themselves and their population economically, when GMO corn was introduced, it eradicated the local populations completely, and now the Mexicans num have, have now have to import corn, and they import it from the United States. So when you look at the impact uh, on that population, you look at the rise in violence and a whole heap of things going on, that would be a perfect example of us not looking at the whole organism and only looking at a single thing, uh, a single piece. And when we're playing on the nanoscale with genes, well, <laughs> I think that's really where it gets interesting ethically. We don't have any idea how putting, making one adjustment of a gene uh, an entire system uh, will affect that system, meaning a single body, never mind the biosphere. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit more about how do we address these things ethically, given our track record, which has been rather poor uh, across the board in everything we do in that regard. What's, what's interesting about an organ as opposed to an organism is that the organ isn't viable outside of the organism. So, for example, if you take the example of a liver, for example, it, it can't live without, without the person. It has to be maintained alive. So th there are, uh, you know, interesting uh, issues about the degree of controllability and how things might escape into nature and uh, get out of control. But it's also uh, useful to distinguish the, the difference between the technology and the business practices associated with that. Mm -hmm. uh, you can block technology because you know you think that it would be used in a bad way, but if this was the case, we wouldn't have knives or forks or swords, and the world would be a little bit like getting on an airplane. I mean, all of the stuff you have to do to get on an airplane nowadays, just because you might use a pointed object as a weapon. But the, I agree, there, ter there certainly is a whole lot of interesting questions that need to be uh, asked, and, uh, and it's all about the f economic future of Europe as well. Whether Europe adopts these things is one question, but other parts of the world do. And even if we don't uh, allow genetically modified organisms to be grown in our fields, we consume genetically modified organisms all the time because that's what global trade flows are made up of. Our second topic is presented by Melina Piermont, Marketing Made Meaningful. What I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to talk about is the future of, uh, of brand and cooperation to support these, these more technology-enabled society we are uh, jumping into. There is uh, importance uh, to have customer and consumer uh, be listening to them and, who, and they are asking much more transparency and to understand you know, who is the big guy behind. Ultimately, with uh, what's happening in technology, we would like to get from, uh, from brand uh, more purpose and that we give back more to society. So the whole future of branding around this idea of sharing more with society and improving people's life become a fundamental value which we are going to look for in the brands. The first everything company does and it should be uh, cleared with rigor uh, inno and the innovation should support the ultimate purpose and cause that the company is after. Let me ask you a question. Given that consumer mistrust is growing, how, what are some simple ways that you think that, that companies can rebuild consumer trust? Two or three well, solutions, you think? The, uh, the consumer trust has to be rebuilt by more transparency, but also on driving more cause. If I look at what you, know, you can do by selling paint and then move to a positioning about selling optimism, and how Axel Nobel, for instance, which is quite, I would say, a very technically, you know, technical product, can now spend a lot of money instead of, you know, of pouring it into media, but in repainting favelas to bring up the optimism and helping people live in different color and see, uh, you know, and have and have a better life in their home. This is a typical product which you would not look at as a first, uh, you know, as a first thing. But then, you know, you you realize the hope it can bring. And a whole new business model now is being set up by people who want to improve the way they live 
in favelas in Brazil, and this is jumping to South Africa and creating a very good movement towards the world. It's also about some detergent brand moving into uh, selling that it is all about learning and education. So how do you give back your marketing money to bring kids in a different way and to bring education instead of just having an advertising on TV? So it is about really looking at what could you do with your product, with your brand, with your company to, uh, to give back to society so that we will create, I would say, and improve people's lives. Patrick, do you have anything to say Yes, about? I'd like to ask Milena a little bit about the relationship between uh, branding, which drives sales, and ultimately um, leadership in companies, which is you know driven by MBAs and the things we're taught in business school, uh, and did, and shapes the way companies make decisions. Because nowadays, you know, one of the biggest, most important uh, things is how does the company do in the market? The the main value that you talk about in business schools is really value to shareholders and very important business schools like Harvard Business School for example have been a champion of the idea that the purpose of a company is to serve shareholders now there are other movements but my impression is that they're still a little bit marginal compared to this very basic idea that the main purpose of a company is to serve the interests of shareholders well Actually, if you look at the research that is done recently with the top 250 CMOs in the world, uh, they realize that there are a lot of companies and brands that are, could, could be parked into a loser and some of them that could be parked into a winner in terms of shareholder value. And if you look at uh, some common elements that you find be, you know, uh, as described by who have, you know, among those CMOs who are parked in the winner for having brought up shareholder value, um, you know, one thing they say is that they are basically looking after a cause. Jim Stingle from Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and I can tell them, you know, all over to the Asian brand, are much more talking about bringing it from inside out. If the people right now, like, you know, from, from Google, Unilever, they, it is about believing in the value you're going to bring. Unilever has, you know, brought the best shareholder value in quite a lot of industries by sustainable living. Now they have integrated vertically everything they do, you know, to create, uh, you know, to create better, you know, to go after the cause in Africa, in water, in everything. And this is, in fact, a big movement, which is not, I would say, a small thing happening right now. And we will see most of these MBAs having this, you know, uh, having this class becoming a major class in the future, which is called, you know, how do you basically market the shared economy? How do you share more of your profit while making profit? I'd, I'd like to sp at, speak to that. I, I like what you're saying. Patrick, what I find is that shareholders follow profit. Companies follow profit. And if we can simply direct profit to solutions that steward life uh, more than they destroy life, all the money will move very quickly and there will be no more discussions of these kinds. It really is about the flow of money and where the profit is coming from, and I think being realistic about that helps us to address that. So if there are organizations who are willing to uh, lead the charge on that front and uh, put money into cause things and other organizations are starting to see the effect of that in their profits, and that can be shown tangibly, then more and more organizations can adopt that approach. That's a very interesting point and it suggests to me that to be successful in this approach you have to find a way to talk to shareholders about this value-based uh, you know branding strategy so it's, it's not just about how you present yourself to clients and and the stakeholders uh, you have to be very good at justifying how this ties in with the profit motive as well and and justify that to your uh, to your shareholders absolutely Agreed. and to your to your point Patrick what happened at Unilever is that Paul Polman which is the CEO changed the shareholders right away in the first six months and took shareholding, uh, you know, pension fund, Al Gore, he really changed the entire capitalization of the company to, to get shareholders that would understand the mission he was after in a food company. Happening in waste also, uh, you know, in frozen food where you can really by eating more frozen food in the, in the world, you could reduce waste. There is a lot of uh, actually uh, private equity going into how can we reduce waste while still making money in the business we invest in. Melina, thank you. Mark, you have a comment? 
Yeah, I have a comment. I, I think we've talked about from a simple company perspective, but there's something that we've forgotten here, and that's the power dynamic. And I think that there's been a change with some of the aspects with the power dynamic. And the change, I think, will continue. And the change is this, is that as consumer pressure has grown, the influence of uh, corporate and social responsibility has also grown. So we now start to see standards that are being introduced, not only by uh, trading bodies, but also by governance bodies, and also uh, a kind of partnership, I would say, between um, the NGO sector, which represents consumers, and also represents activists and other people, and the big companies. So the classic ones that we're hearing about are Greenpeace and World Wildlife Fund, and how they are now supposedly compromised. And if you talk to many activists, they will tell you that those people have sold out. But if you talk to people in those organizations, they see it entirely differently. They say that we've become realistic, and we can actually influence things in a positive direction. So I think that this clashing of empires, clashing of big organizations is very significant. If I look at big pharma, if I look at the agricultural industry, those are massive industries. Companies like Cargill are huge. Applying uh, Glaxo Welcome, huge companies, and they have big impacts on individual governments. And the argument is often said is that because of their capitalization and their power, that they are beyond influence, they're beyond control. But I don't agree with that. I think that we are starting to see ISO standards coming in, which are replicating the 14,000 series, for example, the 26,000 series, which are bringing in environmental standards. Although they're not obligatory, they start, they become a soft power and it gradually grows. And I think that will increase. So I, I think that when we have a new technology, it's always a little bit of a wild west, uh, with people rushing in to, to throw money at it and to try new ideas, and also people on the other side talking about how we want to ride these people out of town. Uh, and after a, a period of time, there's an accommodation, and there's a middle ground. And I think that's what will happen with this technology that, that Patrick has talked about. We will realize some practices are not safe, and they will disappear, and other practices will be accepted. Thank you for joining the Future Now show. Let's go build a better world.